I think we'll get started. Welcome. My name is Michelle Ruth Bernstein, and I will be introducing you today to this panel and its panelists. Today you'll hear from scholars approaching the subject of polymapping from a variety of perspectives and with a variety of purposes. What is the lived experience of the polymath, as opposed to the specialist, say, or the dilettante? What does the polymath represent in terms of our philosophical, historical understanding of human knowledge making? How might polymathy function as a creative strategy, one capable of promoting disciplinary integration, as well as groundbreaking innovations in thought and practice? These are questions of import, particularly the first, what is polymathy? I'll state for the record that according to the Oxford English Dictionary, polymath originated in English in the early 17th century to designate a person of wide knowledge or learning. Actually, Michael reminds me that the concept dates to ancient Greece. Since that time, since ancient Greece, or even 17th century England, the term has often been linked with Renaissance man, and the idea, as expressed on Wikipedia, that the why knowledge be used for some practical purpose. A polymath is a person whose expertise spans a significant number of different subject areas known to draw on complex bodies of knowledge to solve specific problems. As panelists expand on this basic definition, and they will, Listen for the implications they draw for personal identity, professional marginality, meaningful education, and creative preparation for the challenges of today and tomorrow. Our first panelist will be Angela Costalesa. Angela completed her doctorate in human and organizational learning from George Washington University in 2018. Her doctoral dissertation was on the experiences of modern day polymaths. She works for the federal government at the Center for Leadership Development, managing leadership development programs. Next up will be Michael Araki. Michael is trained in finance, management, and psychology, and maintains a lively interest in domains such as music, sports, and philosophy. He is currently working on the systemization of polymathy, and is finishing a series of articles that explore the interface between creativity, entrepreneurial behavior, and corporate finance. Next up will be me. As an independent scholar associated with Michigan State University, my research focus is imaginative thinking and creative polymathy. With Bob Ruth Bernstein, I am co-author of Sparks of Genius, the 13 thinking tools of the world's most creative people. I am also a haiku poet. Finally, Bob Ruth Bernstein. Bob is a professor of physiology at Michigan State University who studies physiological control systems, and autoimmune diseases, as well as science arts interactions. In his spare time, he makes visual art, practices photography, and builds models. He is currently working on a book about artists as scientists. We'll take questions at the end of our presentations, or at the end of all of them. And now, Angela. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Michelle said, my name is Dr. Angela Cotalesa. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about my doctoral dissertation, the research I did on modern day polymaths. But first, I want to tell you why I decided to study that topic. So I've had this question in me for a very long time. It seemed to me like the most important question I needed to ask myself. And that was, how can I live life well? And what does living well look like? I mean, that's what we're all doing here. We're living life for this game called life. How do we do it well? And the answer that came up for me was, with these things, living life fully, including broadly, not narrowly, not living in a bubble, trying lots of things, seeing as much of the planet as I can, traveling, learning as much as possible, making a positive impact, contributing, being brave. I didn't want to live my life like a scared, cheap, uh, and reaching my fullest potential, self-actualization, being whole, being authentic, and living life with no regrets. And there's a quote here, life is meant to be experienced, put yourself out there, do things you've never done, live a life where in the end you will have no regrets. 
And so when it came time for my doctoral, oh, sorry, let me go back here. The, the society we live in tells us, be a specialist. If you want to be successful in your career, pick one thing, not two or three things, and become very expert in that. So we become, in a way, cogs and little wheels. We may aspire to think outside of the box, but actually our disciplines frequently put us in a box and don't let us seek connections and build bridges to other fields. We become siloed, it's like an assembly line approach. I think this takes away from our humanity, um, which is why I wanted to study polymaths, because they seem to be daring curators of their own lives who don't simply uh, exist in the box or become a cog in a wheel. So let me tell you a little bit about my study. I did a qualitative study using phenomenology. The purpose of phenomenology is to understand lived experience. Um, and part of why I did that as well, uh, what little amount of academic literature exists on polymathy looks at one polymath at a time frequently, not across uh, the finding themes and trends among groups. And it also typically looks at people from history, many of whom aren't dead. So I wanted to study real people and not Leonardo da Vinci types, if they even exist nowadays. I wanted to study real accomplished, but real that you would know in your life um, who are alive, <laughs> and I wanted to look at trends among that group. Um, in terms of the requirements for participation, they had to have expertise in both the arts and the sciences. They had to identify as being polymathic. The age requirement was 30 to 64, and they had to have na native English fluency. Their first language didn't have to be English, but they had to be able to speak fluently because that's the only language I speak fluently. Um, I did 13 interviews. We focused on a business assignments method, focusing on life history, details of the experience, and then the meaning making behind, behind all of that. I did snowball samplings. I screened people. Some people didn't make the cut. There were seven females, six males. Um, sorry, that should be 10 Americans and three Europeans. And the actual age range of participants was 30 to 56. And I used Moustakas' data analysis methods. These were my research questions. So I wanted to understand what is the lived experience of polymaths? What does it feel like? What, what is it like being a polymath? How does it feel? How does polymathy impact creativity and creative problem solving? How did polymaths come to be that way? How did polymaths discover their identity? And what in a polymath environment impacted them becoming a polymath? So these are the themes, they're not my conclusions, but if once I just took the data and clustered it into um, segments of meaning, categories of meaning, and subcategories, these are sort of the, the, just what the data pointed to. So in terms of development, this was an interesting finding, uh, theme. Financial resources and family upbringing can both hinder or promote polymathy. So it can promote polymathy for people who have money, they can travel, they can get go to workshops, they can get degrees, and so having money can, can help someone become polymathic. But some of my participants also had the opposite, where they didn't have a lot of resources, so they had to be scrappy and creative, and they couldn't outsource things, so they had to figure it out and learn themselves. So that was an interesting um, theme I found. Also, uh, I asked participants, do you think this is more nature or nurture in your case? I got a mix of both, but I heard from all of them but that their polymathy and the excellence that they had achieved did require some level of effort. You know? okay. um, in terms of their career, polymaths define themselves as highly creative experts across disparate disciplines. They have difficulty making career choices because, again, we live in a society that you know, we live in an age of specialization, and these are people that refuse to be specialists. Um, <clears throat> polymaths cannot be happy as narrow specialists. In terms of their identity, you know, social identity theory says that we learn our identity because we find groups that we're in. So I'm a female, or I'm Caucasian, I have a doctorate, so I identify like that because I can sort of put myself in those categories because there are other people like that. But what I heard from polymaths is they realized that identity because they really couldn't feel comfortable in any one group. And they, so they realized they, they were different, and that's how they got their 
um, identity is polymath. So that's kind of an interesting addendum. It, it's kind of in contrast to what social identity theory says, because there may be some identities that emerge from not being able to find a group. Um, being polymathic impacts one's social experiences, for sure, the storytelling, and like, if I say I'm polymathic, is it boasting, or you know, is it too much info, are people even going to believe you know, this cobbled zigzag story of my life? So that was definitely something I heard from them. Um, and I didn't ask about this, but some of my participants, even though they seem very confident, they're accomplished, they're movers and shakers, they're doing things in their lives, a significant number of the participants told me that they feel imposter syndrome. I didn't ask about that, but they brought it up. They said, because I'm not a specialist, when I'm comparing myself to specialists, I feel like a fake. I feel like I have imposter syndrome. So that was also interesting. Um, polymaths are voracious learners, of course. A lot of self-directed, lifelong learning you see with polymaths. Can't separate learning from, from polymaths. And effective polymaths are time managers. They have to manage their, in order to be polymath. They have to manage their time and juggle lots of things. So conclusions. I'm going to go back to my research questions, and then I'm going to tell you the conclusions that answered the question. So back to what is the lived experience of polymaths? To be a polymath, one must accept not fitting in a box and perhaps even embodying apparent contradictions. Polymath, polymathy is being intrapersonally diverse. I want to emphasize this intrapersonal diversity concept, by the way. When we think about diversity, we think about diversity in groups at the meso or macro levels. Um, but diversity, I posit, can exist within a single individual. And this shows up in the gut microbiome. If you look in the literature, you'll find um, articles that say for people who have more intrapersonal diversity in their gut, in that microbiome, they are healthier. So just like intrapersonal diversity can exist in the gut, I am saying intrapersonal diversity can exist in your personhood as well, and that would be by showing up as a polymath in the way that you live your life. All right, what is it like being a polymath? Polymaths are exposed broadly. They think creatively. They can build bridges and make connections across disparate fields, and they think strategically, and they're effective time managers. How does it feel to be a polymath? Being a polymath can make life richer, but it can also be quite difficult. This is what I heard from my participants. Because it's difficult because of the context in which we live that says we organizations especially prefer specialists. So if you don't fit that mold, your life may be more difficult. Um, how does polymathy impact creativity and creative problem solving? Actually, this is what I heard from polymaths was their greatest superpower. Because they have a very broad toolkit, they're able to come up with innovative solutions that wouldn't be possible if they were single disciplinary experts. I'm not saying that specialists cannot be creative. They can be creative in a certain kind of way within their silo, but polymaths can be creative and innovative in a different, unique way that can be quite impactful. How did polymaths come to be? Polymathy develops due to a combination of nature and nurture, I mentioned that earlier, and is maintained through self-directed learning. I would say polymaths feel a compulsion to learn, in a way. How did polymaths discover their identity? I mentioned this, polymath identity is discovered from not fitting in. Polymath identity can be difficult to fully own and explain to others. What in a polymath's environment impacted them become a, becoming a polymath? Family and financial resources impact the emergence of polymathy, and that could be because family was not supportive, and they needed a ticket, they needed skills to get out, or their family was supportive and helped them explore. I think my time's up, right? So I'm gonna skip through these slides and just end with this quote, a mind that is stretched by new experiences can never go back to its old dimensions, Oliver Wendell Holmes. And here's my info, my email, Facebook group, YouTube channel, and website, if you'd like to keep in touch. All right, thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Michael Reiki. Um, I discovered the concept of polymathy nine years ago, <clears throat> and at the moment I read it for the first time. By the way, it's, it was in a book by Carl Sagan, the famous astronomer, and I felt it was such a strong, powerful concept, powerful idea. And then, after that, I started my studies, advanced studies in the area, 
And when I took a look at the literature, scientific literature, I found almost nothing. Like the field of polymathic studies was practically built uh, regarding creativity studies by those people here. Uh, Robert, Michel, we have some other works by James Kaufman, uh, Ronald Guerrero, uh, Zorana Ivicevic, some uh, uh, another person, uh, Bharat Siriraman, and that's all. And that's such a pity, that's such a strong, uh, rich phenomenon and construct is not being represented in the scientific literature. So I took for me as a as a, a, in my scientific endeavor, uh, the, the job, let's say, to help systematize, help bring scientific uh, rigor and inquiry to understand this great phenomenon that many people, it resonates with so many people in, the, in every field, in all areas, uh, and they are not being backed up by us, the scientists, doing studies. So they are left like into a disgraceful world, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous without the help of systematic work in this topic. So I think that's, that's here, we here, psychologists, um, we have as our goal uh, the idea to help people through systematic study. So that's such an important thing. And here is like a, a, a call I'm making to you if you'd like to participate in that. We would be so glad to welcome you in, in this research area that's so important and has just started. And then uh, my question is, what is this phenomenon of polymathy? How does it work? And then to understand this phenomenon, we have to understand uh, I mean, when we make science, we, we need to build a map to understand reality. We, use, we need to use methods, but first, we have to define what you're going to study. What's the territory? What is polymathy? And I like philology. By the way, <laughs> I should excuse for the title. I use syndrome because in philology, syndrome means running together. So it doesn't mean that it's a <laughs> disease, but it's a lot of things going together. And we, as scientists, we are used to very simple correlations, like one thing uh, causes X causes Y, and then we have in life, especially in the life sciences, such interaction effects that if we don't appreciate them, we're gonna, we're gonna not uh, have a good appreciation of how real phenomena works. And anyway, polymathy comes from Greece. Poly is very much many. And mathy is such an interesting word. It means, or the verb montano means to learn, but especially with inquiry. So that's a, another word that got lost in history. We don't have such a word nowadays to refer to knowledge that's acquired through inquiry. Okay, and then it, we can trace back this discussion to ancient Greece with uh, the uh, schools of philosophers like Pythagoras and uh, after the, the philosophy got more, how can I say, crystallized in the Hellenic world, um, they, they other authors and uh, commentators uh, found that there were two types of people, uh, the mathematicy and the acousmatici, and this type of people here were like the scientists of that time, the people, the philosophers, who inquired into uh, the nature of the world with the rigor or the possible rigor of that time. And since they looked for rigor and they went to try uh, to find proofs or to find, uh, to describe the world in a more systematic and precise way. And in the end, this thing became what we know today as mathematics, all right? And on the other hand, we had those kind of people who 
just listened and repeated the ideas, the acousmatics here. So, polymathy uh, through history changed and in the Renaissance period it became, sorry, the study of the trivium and quadrivium and not only that, the inquiry and the ability to understand the world and one thing that's very important, since in the Renaissance period, this is from the 1600s, uh, traveling, so having a bunch of different experiences. And then, through the analysis of the literature, I came with these categorizations of six types, and we have the passive polymathy, which is more about the acquisition of knowledge, here is more semantic knowledge, here is more episodic memories, lived experiences, experiential polymathy. This is the kind of polymathy that we had in the Renaissance, like knowing every genre of knowledge, which was the trivium and quadrivium. Okay, don't get me wrong, it's not every knowledge in the world, it's not every craft, every vocation, it's just what they considered the liberal arts and the real arts at that time. And we here are much more interested in the creative polymathy, which we have this avocational polymathy, when we have this mix of vocations and avocations, and we can create new things from that. Robert is gonna, and Michelle are going to talk about that more. And we have um, polymathy at the pro C level, so people that are created creative in their professions, but not necessarily Leonardo da Vinci's or Benjamin Franklin's or Goethe. So polymathy is not Leonardo da Vinci. It's a rich, complex phenomenon that is available for anyone. Uh, and then, to define polymathy, we arrived at these three dimensions. You must have breadth, of course. You cannot be an aerospecialist. You must also have depth. You cannot be superficial. If you're superficial, you are a dilettante, not a polymath. And integration is the key. I'm going to talk about that more. This is my provisional definition. I just put it here. I'm going to send you the slides. Okay. And here is our development. And in the scientific inquiry, it's much easier to go into this. Okay, these are, this is the four P's of creativity. Most of you are. Uh, aware of that, but of course it's much more, it's much easier to study the product and we have this, for example, stereometric studies by Simonton and others, but we have to inquire into the process or the person and how the press, for example, Angela talked about the environment, family and having resources, how do these variables come together to make or not make a polymathic person? And here, integration is the key, and I love this, uh, this story that Robert and Michel put in the book. A guy who could understand everything about book knowledge, but could not translate book knowledge to real-life problems. So he knows all the equations for torque, but he didn't understand that to open a door, you are using the torque equations. So if you try to push a large door, a heavy door, near the hinge, you cannot, you have to go further. That's integration, all right? You have the synergistic networks of enterprise, of many people, of uh, some scientists, and you have integrative themes like Herbert Simon, that they're gonna talk more about him, uh, that can bring together many things into a single theme. That's a very famous strategy. And we have Angela's work here, and but a warning: polymathy is not a bed of roses. Okay, so it has benefits, but it has also costs. So some people are sometimes selling, being that being polymath is going to solve all the problems. It is important, especially when you need innovation, creativity, get out of the box. But it has also some costs. We have to acknowledge that. This is the model I'm on. Um, okay, this is the model I'm trying to advance, and I, yeah, I, it's over. And just one thing, the path to polymathy is not only one, you can be a polymathy, a polymathic person from different angles. And to finish here, I don't have time for that, but anyway, 
Uh, it's just a new tool I'm developing to measure trade polymathy, and then I can talk to you later. And here, uh, what I would like to, to bring, I'm trying to integrate some studies. Here's a study by BD and others. And I'm so uh, uh, puzzled that people are not using the prefrontal cortex, <laughs> and that's something uh, I think polymaths are more used to do. And we have this emotional connections, very interesting study by Stella and others, okay? And here is my model. It's just um, for you to have here. I'm not going to go into that. I'm going to send you the slides later. And to finish, uh, it's a very important phenomenon, and we are beginning to put our drops in the motion. Thank you very much. mixing and integrating vocations with avocations, either simultaneously or serially, over the course of a lifetime. So let me unpack that understanding a bit. First, active engagement refers to productive activity. In other words, the making of ideas and things in a sustained and cognitively challenging manner. In his Nobel autobiographical statement, Douglas North, who got his Nobel in economics, called attention to the extra scholarly activities that have complemented research and enriched my life. Music, flying, fishing, hunting, and above all, photography. North loved listening to classical music, but as a listener only, the activity does not meet the threshold of actively making something. In contrast, North did actively make photographs throughout his life. Indeed, he felt himself to be a photographer in addition to being North had multiple interests, a signpost for polymathy. As Picasso and Beatrix Potter made clear, these multiple interests can be within or across domains. Picasso explored many forms of visual expression, including drawing, painting, printmaking, and sculpture. Potter developed committed interests in natural history, specifically the study of mushrooms, but also in art, in writing, and in pioneering land conservation. Potter pursued her interests as hobbies and then as professions. Winston Churchill also combined avocation with vocation. As a politician, he made the bulk of his living from writing. In middle age, he began to paint for pleasure, eventually at a level of achievement high enough to participate in numerous exhibitions, many of them anonymously. In his book, Painting as Pastime, he pronounced, the cultivation of a hobby and new forms of interest is to be a policy of first importance to a public man. Churchill pursued his life his late blooming interest in painting while in and out of political office. Other polymaths also engage in serious pursuits, either seriously or simultaneously or both. Gordon Parks, an American photographer of the mid 20th century, came to prominence as a photographer at Life magazine, then branched out into a concurrent career as journalist, poet, novelist, painter, musician, composer, and film director. After directing a film version of his autobiographical novel, The Learning Tree, he wrote, directed, and composed the music for Shaft, one of the first action films featuring a black protagonist. Neville Shu spent the first 20 years of his life as a mechanical engineer in aero aeronautical design. He began publishing novels under a pseudonym almost from the start, but only after leaving his engineering behind in middle age did he openly embrace a second career as a novelist. Indeed, she was best-selling author throughout the 1950s and 60s, the 1957 post-apocalyptic Long Beach, 
His best known novel has been twice made into film. Now, if polynubby is a viable creative strategy, one would expect to find it prevalent among groups of creative individuals. And to that end, Bob and I have been assessing evidence for polymathy among Nobel Prize winners in all categories. Bob's work on scientists and their allocations demonstrated that Nobel Prize winners in the sciences, as well as U.S. National Academy of Sciences members and members of the U.S. Royal Society, are much more likely to be polymathic than the average scientists or U.S. citizens. This finding has recently hit the popular press, both in David Epstein's book, Range, and in a column by David Brooks just a couple of weeks ago, citing Epstein, citing Bob, compared to other scientists, Nobel laureates are at least 22 times more likely to partake as an amateur actor, dancer, magician, or other type of performer. To complement this data, Bob and I have completed a study of Nobel Prize winners in all categories through the year 2008. We tracked interests, not just in arts and crafts, but in five additional fields or domains, writing, particularly artistic writing, humanities and social sciences, sciences, nature, nature immersion, and sports. You can note that each Nobel group displays interests in fields beyond those closely associated with their prize-winning disciplines. In fact, for instance, the literature Nobels in red dominate in artistic writing, as expected, but also in the humanities. They have noticeable interests, too, in the arts and, to a lesser extent, in science. Physicists in blue, along with chemists in light green and physiologists in dark green, they dominate in science interests. But economists in purple also have an outsized interest in science, as well as in the humanities and social sciences. What I'd like to pick up on now is the incidence of inter- or cross-domain interests among Nobel laureates. This figure displays the percentage of laureates with interests in one, two, three, four, five, or six domains, with a peak point for physics and physiologists, uh, doctors, or Physiologists in laureates in one domain, their peak is at one domain. Peace laureates peak at two domains, and chemists, economists, and literature laureates peak at three domains. In no case do laureates with a single interest domain predominate. Trans or cross domain polymathy clearly characterizes most Nobel Prize winners. So let me throw in a few examples. Gao Xinjiang. As much, he is as much a painter as a writer. For the Nobel Prize, he earned most of his living from his works as an artist, with over 30 international ink wash painting exhibitions, and he continues to ply both vocations. Maurice Allais, trained in the sciences and engineering, in addition to his career in economics, he maintained simultaneous parallel interests or careers, his words, in physics and history. He received honors for his experimental research into gravity and gravity anomalies, in addition to his original and independent discoveries in economics. He also devoted himself to writing a history of civilizations that was never published. Fridtjof Nansen was a great athlete in his youth. He won the Norwegian Skating Championship, broke world speed skating records, and won an annual cross-country skiing race for 11 years straight. He used these skills in the polar expeditions undertaken as an explorer and scientist, and he parlayed his expeditionary prominence into diplomatic peace, peace initiatives that won him the Nobel Prize. He also drew and painted avocationally. Next, Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkin, pioneer in X-ray crystallography, was an avocational artist throughout her life. Vocational, if you count the art that artifact drawings she executed for her parents when she was a teen. Not only did she decipher the protein structure of insulin, she painted it. Nobel laureates are likely to be cross-domain polymaths. They are also, as a group, likely to be intra or within domain polymaths. 54 to 84 percent have two or more interests within a professional domain, circled in red. Additionally, each group displays multiple interests with 
within other non-professional domains. For instance, 37% of economists have two or more interests in science. Bob and I also determined the number of laureates who engaged in multiple genres within the home domain and in one or more extra professional domains. Circled in red, 68% of the economics laureates and 82% of literature laureates display two or more developed interests in their home domain as well as interests in two or more extra domains or additional domains. Circled in green, 48 to 54 percent of science Nobels and peace Nobels along with them display both kinds of polymathy. Robert Dranath Tagore makes a good exemplar of within and across domain polymathy. Within literature, there was hardly a genre that Tagore did not exploit. He was playwright, poet, essayist, short story writer, and novelist. In addition, he displayed wide-ranging, cross-domain interests in the arts and humanities. He wrote and performed over a thousand songs. He took up painting to wide acclaim. He set up a school still in operation today and developed its curriculum. Clearly, he excelled in multiple overlapping worlds. Finally, our working definition suggests that creative polymath depends on the integration or synthesis of wide-ranging interests. Herb Simon, for instance, was often hailed as a Renaissance man, and not only because of his wide-ranging knowledge and contributions to artificial intelligence, decision science, mathematics, cognitive psychology, political science, philosophy, and economics. Significantly enough, Simon also devoted himself to as many hobbies as he did fields of academic interest, integrating them within overall purposes. These avocations included chess, piano playing, musical composition, drawing, and painting. Each one became grist for his mill, which was understanding the cognitive foundations of decision making. Quote, I can rationalize any activity I engage in as simply another form of research on cognition. I can always view my hobbies as part of my research, end quote. And to view all activities as part of one grand whole was, in fact, the point. Simon consciously integrated his multiple interests and activities into a singular focus. The Renaissance mind, he argued, is not broader than other intelligent minds, but happens to care, happens to cover a narrow swathe across the multidimensional space of knowledge. In his case, the controlling purpose or problem was decision making. And in his case, as in others, vocational, avocational polymathy became a deliberate strategy for maximizing the potential for creative success. In conclusion, the kind of polymathy that concerns us here supposes active engagement in more than one discipline or domain. Individuals working at the highest levels in the arts, sciences, and humanities are often polymaths. 50% and more of Nobel laureates have interests across and within domains. Polymathic integration within and across domains can be a deliberate creative strategy. Thank you. Michelle's been talking about and taking in slightly different directions. <clears throat> First, I'm going to talk about polymathic curiosity uh, as possibly a trait that most polymaths share. Uh, integrated uh, networks and enterprise, which really addresses the issue of how people integrate all their ideas. Polymathic interests uh, across the different intra and cross domain or trans domain ideas, which Michelle already introduced to you. And then uh, the idea that polymaths are ambi-cerebral, which I will define when I get there. All right, so I want to start out with uh, just an introduction to a study which I followed up on uh, when I was quite uh, young, about 30 years ago. Uh, there was a uh, psychologist named Bernice Idison who was the first person to ever do a longitudinal study 
of scientists. She got 40 scientists who agreed to take a whole series of psychological tests. Uh, they followed their uh, various publications, the impact, uh, how many prizes they got, all sorts of different things. Every five years, they would uh, do these studies, correlate all the different things. The study lasted over 30 years. And at some point, uh, unfortunately, Bernice died. Uh, my mother and I took over the project and watched these 40 people. Now, it's a very interesting group because uh, 11 of the people in the group ended up in the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, four of them got Nobel Prizes. Uh, the rest had fairly average careers, except for three that didn't even get tenure. So we have a very diverse group, and we tried to get a sense of what differentiated uh, the very successful people from those who weren't as successful. So one of the things we found was that the most successful were much more curious in a number of ways that we could measure than were the people uh, who were not very successful or had very average careers. This fits with a lot of literature that's already out there, obviously, in the psychological field. The creative people uh, tend to be more open to novel uh, ideas, novel uh, activities than is the typical person. Just to give you some idea of the actual data, uh, rather than give you statistics, here are the people in the lowest quartile in terms of being able, being successful. Uh, almost all of them said things like, uh, you know, creativity is a lie to hard work, which is why I spent so much time reading. They didn't want to work hard. Uh, I don't try specifically to develop hobbies. I'd say work is its own reward. Almost all of these people, I actually mentioned time uh, management earlier, said that if only they worked 14 hours a day, they would be more successful. I will uh, tell you in a little bit in advance before I show you the next group or the most successful. All of the people in the highest success group said, I'm a lazy son of a bitch. It's almost a direct quote from someone. They weren't, of course, but they realized that hard work was not necessarily the way to be creative. I believe in a balanced life. That's not a good thing in this particular Here's some important quotes from the top quartile people. I was always almost interested in anything. I'm always taking things apart, putting them together. Um, I have a big tendency to use my hands. I also have a tendency to use my intellect. Sciences are a great way of putting these things together, so forth and so on. So these are illustrating what Michelle was talking about. The people are integrating their various interests. They don't see the things that they do outside of their profession as drawing away from their activity or their creativity, but actually promoting it. Uh, an example here from one of the Nobel Prize winners who was not in the group, but just to show this, that it's generalizable, Chris John uh, Mustin Bohard. She uh, has done all sorts of things. It says very specifically that what she thinks makes her is her very wide-ranging curiosity. She likes to do everything. She paints and actually illustrates all of her own works. The lower right there, she plays the flute at a semi-professional level. She has a, her own cookbook, which is a bestseller in Germany right now. It's been on the bestseller list for about five years. She designs her own fiendishly difficult puzzles and sells those, and that's all in addition uh, to the work she's doing as an embryologist. So curiosity is very important. Uh, Michelle mentioned that not only do you have to have the curiosity, you need to integrate it. So it turns out that many people have noticed this in the past. Uh, Dewey mentioned integrative activity sets. Howard Gruber, who studied the creativity of Charles Darwin, called these networks of enterprise. Uh, I was doing a study of scientists. I ended up calling them correlative talents, different talents that melded together in some way. Uh, I didn't realize these other people had actually already done these studies until later. Uh, obviously, we were all on the same kinds of things, so Michelle and I now like to talk about integrated networks of enterprise as sort of a way of taking all those terms and putting them together. Uh, just to give you some examples of how Nobel Prize winners in the sciences have done this, Alexis Carroll got his Nobel Prize in 1912 for developing the ways uh, do stitching for major organ transplants. He actually adapted that directly from lace making, uh, which he learned from his mother and then took professional lessons in. 
and the techniques are our direct uh, translation. Alexander Fleming uh, actually discovered penicillin while he was making microbial art. He happened to notice that some of his beautiful fungi, which had blue-green colors, intersected and killed off some of the bacteria he was growing. And so he was taking an artistic hobby, which was obviously pretty bizarre, and playing around <laughs> in the lab and noticing things that nobody else could possibly have noticed. Uh, some more recent people, Konstantin uh, Novoselov, uh, his Nobel Prize in Physics, uh, he directly addresses the issue of, well, were we doing physics? And he says, well, I'm not even clear I'm really doing physics. It's not even clear I'm really doing science in the broadest sense. Uh, the way we made the discovery was simply being curious. And every Friday afternoon, they would basically just, let's go think about the craziest thing we can and see whether we can actually do something about it. That's just pure curiosity. You know, they actually developed this into a strategy. All right, so polymathic can involve, as Michelle said, multiple locations or applications and melding them in some way. So some people are transdomain, as she said, and some people are intradomain. Uh, you can see Fleming as a case of point transdomain, the loss of as intradomain, just doing science across all the different ways you can do it. Again, some examples here, very specifically, Gertrude Ellion won her Nobel Prize uh, in medicine for developing strategies for developing uh, drugs. She developed about uh, eight different classes of drugs which are now used in their best sellers. Uh, she was actually one of the most productive uh, drug developers ever in the entire history of the, of the world. Uh, she started out in organic chemistry, as you might, might expect, found that wasn't sufficient to address the problem, so she learned biochemistry realized that wasn't enough, so she went into pharmacology, um, but that wasn't enough because she needed to address problems in the immune system. She developed transplant drugs and drugs for HIV, so she had to learn immunology, and it goes on and on. Um, this is extremely unusual for a scientist. Uh, we've actually done studies that show that most scientists stay directly in the field and they get their PhD. Another example, Walter Gilbert, uh, developed many of the techniques we use for uh, modern molecular biology. They got a Nobel Prize for that. Uh, started out actually as a physicist, uh, then turned into a biophysicist, then a biochemist, a molecular biologist. He ended up spinning off his own companies, became an entrepreneur. He now self identifies as a uh, photographer. Uh, Francis Arnold, another example, started out as a mechanical and aerospace engineer ends up in molecular biology. Again, I need to emphasize how unusual this is. So going back to Ideson's uh, study, which when we did all the interviews of her people, one of the, again, differences we saw between the people who uh, were fairly average in their careers and the people who were extremely uh, successful is that the average person believed in the two cultures, that there are the artists and there are the scientists and there are the social people and so forth. These are all different people who can't communicate. Without exception, all the people who got into the National Academy and won Nobel Prize have said, there is no such thing as two cultures. We do it all. And that, it just dropped right out uh, of, of the interviews without uh, anyone even really looking at it. What I want to end by saying is basically that what these people are telling us is what Nobel Prize winner Roger Sperry tried to tell us. Uh, he's the one who did all the split brain research, and almost everybody runs around and now talks about right brain people and left brain people, and creativity's on one side and rationality's on the other, and so forth and so on. But what you have to remember is that Roger Sperry said in a normal brain that you are not split. And in fact, everybody is a whole brain person. He called this ME cerebral, that you are using both sides of your brain at the same time. And the people who we're looking at as polymaths are the ones who are integrating that most completely. All right, so that's the end of my talk. Thank you. I'm going to do just to really quickly uh, uh, two quick slides to give you some idea of where uh, we think this field may be going. Michael, in his uh, talk, has tried to get people excited about this. We're all very excited about this field. There are a huge number of people who are starting to get into this. 
Dean Simonton, James Kaufman, Royal Piano, uh, Adam Kaufman, Scott Barry Kaufman are some of the big names you may recognize who are now beginning to work in this area. We think that's really exciting uh, to have more people doing it. Some of the key questions that really haven't been addressed yet are things like what's the relationship between polymathy and versatility? Are they the same thing? Uh, are they different things? A lot of the answer is going to come down to process versus products. Uh, do you have to have proven that you can uh, succeed at a very high level to be a polymath? Um, and is that the difference between being a polymath and simply versatile? You have lots of training, but you haven't demonstrated it yet. Uh, so do you have to be versatile before you can become a polymath, or are they really the same thing? Uh, is it combinatorial? The more things that you know, does that increase the probability of your uh, creativity? Or is there some point where you know so much that you can't see the connections anymore and it becomes a negative thing? Is it a personality? Is this something that people are born with this tendency? Or is this something we can actually be training people to do? Uh, that's two very, very different ways of looking at things. Or is this like a talent? We all have this talent. Uh, that we need to develop it, those kinds of things. Uh, I think what Angela mentioned, lots of the polymaths uh, are self-learners. Is that a requirement? Does everybody become an, uh, uh, who becomes a polymath become an automatic act because there's no way to get the training that you need? Or do you actually need that formal training to succeed in our institutional areas these days? Uh, the 10,000 um, uh, hour rule for mastering something would suggest polymaths really are going to have difficulty uh, existing. Uh, how did somebody like a uh, Leonardo da Vinci manage to master so many different areas if it takes 10,000 hours for each of them? Or is there a way to get uh, past that and, and uh, make it quicker? And uh, a question we really haven't done any research on is handicaps. Uh, not everybody can do everything. Um, does what you can't do actually force you into areas where you are more um, talented? And does that somehow direct how you become a polymath? And finally, I just want to mention quickly that there are a number of universities and other institutions starting to have formal programs. Uh, so that's also exciting because, again, Angela mentioned that you know, without institutional support, it's difficult for polymaths to exist. It's also a Called to do the research, as we found, all of us have found in the past, uh, with that institutional uh, support and the growth in it, uh, there are real opportunities. So, thank you. Uh, we'll take questions now for anybody, and I think we have maybe two minutes to do that, but uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Or you can just come up, I guess we can just, let's do it. Well, yes. Go ahead. So there's a thrust of interest in interdisciplinary research. And I just wondered if you could comment on that. Um, because to do interdisciplinary research, you want to understand deeply two disciplines, to be able to communicate in two different languages in some ways. But we don't think of that in terms of polymath. And I just wondered if you could so, uh, so, I mean, very quickly, one, one of the questions uh, that has to be addressed really is what do we mean by interdisciplinary? So I was actually trained in history of science, and one of the reasons I did that is I thought I'd be able to take history and I'd be able to take science and put them together. I only discovered when I got into the field that history of science is not interdisciplinary, or it, it is by terms, but it means between. It's not a combination. So there's a difference between transdisciplinary, things that go across things, things that are integrated, uh, and their own specialty fields. And many times these terms are used interchangeably. All of them probably relate to polymathy in some ways. Uh, some of them are addressing the issue of um, taking different fields and putting them together. Uh, so as a historian, I had to learn how to use historical methods to address a scientific or a scientist doing their work or a scientific institution. Um, I did have to learn different languages and learn how to talk to two different groups. I actually studied with Thomas Kuhn, who gave us a lecture 
the very first lecture we gave in every class was, here are the two languages. Here's how a scientist reads a, a paper. Here's how a historian reads a paper. And they're actually very different methods, and they're going to use different terms. Um, so addressing that issue of terminology or methodology is really certainly critical. Um, how that all folds into polymathy is, I think, an open question at this point, and maybe that's where the polymath programs and institutions are starting to, to develop. Well, have, they'll have to address this. So that's a good question. I think we must stay on here. Okay, thank you very much. Kim asked questions to us, and we are very happy to, to talk to you. Okay, thank you very much for your presence.